All right, everyone, it's me again. Um, I have the unenviable task of standing between you and lunch, um, but I'm going to make this session as exciting as possible. And I think that you have heard from this morning um, what uh, we've heard. We've basically heard from philanthropic sector, from the public sector, and now we come to a perspective from financial institutions and corporates. Um, and I want all of you to just kind of take your phone out, not to text your friends, um, but just to answer this one question that we have for you as we go into this plenary just before lunch. And what is it that Asia needs to enable an equitable transition? If you could just give us some of your thoughts, uh, we'd love that. And join it at Slido, and you can. As all of you put your words in, I'd like to kind of introduce my panelists this morning. We have Mr. Eric Lim, Chief Sustainability Officer at UOB Bank, Mr. Bae Su Kyung, Vice Chairman of RGE, Mike Ng, Chief Sustainability Officer at OCBC Bank, and Eti Federico Tankongo, Senior Vice President and Chief Compliance Officer at BDO Unibank. Now, we're starting to see um, the words come in. And uh, gentlemen, I, you know, I have the privilege of, of having this discussion. Um, and we've heard uh, Eurodance's very strong call to action. Don't wait for the regulators. Uh, the enabling environment is there. Um, what do we really need to enable an equitable transition? I'm going to start with you, Eric. Uh, I, I think we need orchestration and alignment. So I agree that uh, regulatory frameworks are starting to come in, national development plans are starting to get put together, uh, real economy players are starting to put their plans together and financial services are piling in. But we need to be able to find where things misalign or they don't work or there are blockages in order to solve for those misalignments, right? Um, that, that's my 15 second summary. Thank you. I agree that the point is alignment. Um, the regulators have done. I agree with the, with the last powerful call that the next narrative, it is, while it is government initiated, it should be privately driven. Thank you. Mike. Perhaps I'll just share from OCB, OCBC's perspective how we're actually looking at equitable transition. So broadly, when you look at the transition, we look at it, there are a couple of things we look at. The first is really how we implement it through policies and the guidelines that we have got. In terms of policies, uh, if I recall when I started banking my career some time ago, in fact, many years ago, um, ESG assessment was really not a thing. I was in a foreign bank, right? And it was supposed to be more developed, but it was very rudimentary at the time. But it was really in the past five to 10 years that we really see ESG assessment being becoming much more rigorous, not only on the E part, but on, also on the social. So, for example, when we actually assess transactions at OCBC, we do look at many of the social parameters, including you know, what kind of stakeholder engagement when the client ha that a client has. Um, do, they, you know, um, do they have policies that promote uh, a community you know, to the extent that community needs to be displaced? What kind of policies they have got to cater to that? So, and uh, we are also a signatory to the equator principles, and that helps a lot because if you look at equator principles, they really cater to large infrastructure projects, and those are the ones that have a huge impact, whether you're talking about environmental or social. And when we do a transaction, again, for such large projects, by being a signatory, we do um, look at the ESIA reports, the environmental and social assessment, and that really helps us and gives us the discipline to look at transactions. So that's on the policies part. On the guidelines, quite encouragingly, we are actually seeing evolution of guidelines to cater to a lot of uh, equitable trans transition topics. Um, for example, if you look at the ASEAN taxonomy, you have got sections that are now dedicated to equitable transaction. What needs to be done to labor relations? What needs to be done on human rights, on impact to people from the projects? And if you look at another topic that is very uh, favorite of the day at the moment, which is a co phase out, if you look at the various guidelines, and in fact, there was a guideline that was released by MAS just two days ago, there was uh, a lot of coverage on what the just transition means in terms of retraining workers, making sure that you know, when one of the industry is being taken away, that workers are retrained and a new industry is being implemented. So as we go along, we'll continue to look at such guidelines and implement them and incorporate into our policies. So I think that is gonna help policies and guidelines. 
And the second one I'll touch on is really on product development, how we look at equitable transaction through our product development. If you look at the market over the past three years, a lot of focus or much of it is focused on sustainable financing. But at the end of the day, if we want to turn the dial in the ASEAN context, we cannot just focus on sustainable financing for the simple reason that it actually makes up less than 10% of the overall financing requirements. Transition finance is the one that is going to make the difference. And especially in this part of the world, we need to help our clients transition. And that is also an instrument where we can be inclusive. And sharing other things that we have done, we help a client issue a social loan. It's a healthcare client um, just last year. For OCBC, we also issued a social bond that was end of uh, sorry, a couple of years ago. But the use of proceeds is really to fund women entrepreneurs, women or SMEs that are owned by women. So we do very much look at the social aspects when it comes to use of proceeds. And another instrument we use quite frequently is the Sesame Linked Loan, SLL. So when the clients meet certain KPIs, we actually give them a discount on the loan. In the past, a lot of the KPIs were based on the E part, you know, carbon emissions reduction, etc. But in recent years, we have actually turned that around quite a bit and look at social factors instead. So we have actually moved on from gender diversity to more transitional or social uh, matters, including like contribution to communities, workforce retraining, etc. etc. Thank you very much, Mike, for that overview. Um, and we have got a really interesting um, you know, diversity of words that have come in, uh, transparency being the key one, collaboration, accountability. Um, there's one at the bottom here, and corruption, which I think you know, is perhaps the elephant in the room in this region, just energy transition. So Kian, coming to you, what are what some of your reflections about what Asia needs to enable an equitable transition? I mean, if you want to enable equitable transition, fundamentally there must be an equitable transition plan as the basis for you to take action. And that is what our group of companies in RG have done since uh, 2020. Uh, you know, in 2015, uh, the UN launched SDGs, you know, as well as the Paris Climate Agreement. It took us a while for our companies, you know, various companies in the pub and paper sector, the palm oil sector, as well as gas sector, to come up with a equitable transition plan, so to speak, right? Which essentially uh, focuses on three key pillars, right? One is decarbonization. Uh, work needs to be done, uh, plan needs, uh, plans and work needs to be done on reduction of uh, excessive energy consumption. Uh, number two in, in the area of decarbonization is transition to renewable energy. As it is already our sector, particularly say in the forestry sector, you know, uh, pulp and paper sector, 80% of our energy are biomass energy, right? Because we essentially take trees, uh, uh, and separate them, the, the cellulose goes to produce pulp, the lignin goes to produce energy. So 80% are energy. And we have transitioned the other 20% from coal base to uh, renewable energy. For instance, in April, we already have 11 megawatts of uh, solar power, and by 2030, we are moving towards uh, 50 megawatts. And even for the 80% uh, biomass uh, energy, there are biogenic CO2, which we are looking at projects to try and capture it, you know, so that we can then, uh, with hydrolysis, electrolysis, add to the green hydrogen to produce various products. So that is a transition to renewable energy. And the last uh, approach towards decarbonization is the other side of the equation, which is carbon sequestration. You know, uh, in the way we converted our concession, you know, we, we actually have a commitment to say for every hectare of plantation I establish, I want to have one hectare of conservation area. Today, we are 83%, right? And that already, I think, succeeds, uh, exceeds that of the Nature Corp requirement of 30%. But we are moving towards one-to-one, -one, right? And in, in the larger single piece of conservation area we have, uh, which is twice as Singapore, twice the size of Singapore. Uh, you know, we already have done biodiversity survey, uh, carbon sequestration studies, carbon studies, and even social studies. 
right? And there are about 800 over uh, uh, flora and, and uh, biodiversity species there, and a lot of them are endangered and threatened. And we are working with WCS on projects like stopping illegal wildlife trade, so that poaching of this uh, will stop. Right, so that is uh, nature side, you know, and on top of that, uh, we are protecting this conservation area through our production protection model, so to speak. Uh, we have a ring of plantations surrounding our conservation area, which if effectively stops or, or uh, slows down encroachment because uh, it's a deterrent, a buffer to deter encroacher. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, our production uh, for every piece of, uh, every ton of wood I bring to the mill, we donate $1 to a conservation fund to fund all the conservation activities in our conservation area. One of which is protection, one of which is regrowing the, the, the flor, flora species and so on and so forth. Right, so, so that is decarbonization. The second major trust is secularity, right? Uh, we are the world largest viscose producer in the world, which goes to produce textiles. And we know that textile industry is quite bad in terms of global carbon emission. It, it is about six to 10% uh, uh, of global emission. 40% uh, of textile uh, produced or never consumed. So we call them pre-consumer, uh, pre uh, pre-waste, uh, so to speak. Uh, and less than 1% of textile are recycled. So it's a serious problem. And today, uh, you know, we, we, we made a major initiative, invested uh, 6 million with NTU uh, research uh, organization, the material science, to help us uh, look into a design of a urban fit textile recycling plant. Urban fit because it must work in Singapore low consumption of electricity or, or renewable electricity, so low carbon, low use of chemicals, better still no use of chemicals, low uh, use of water, so to speak, right? So, so it's a very challenging task for them, you know, but imagine it, if you can do it in Singapore, a place with 5 million population, then any cities can have that, uh, a few of them in multiples, uh, depending on the population for textile recycling. And after recycling, the recycled pulp can then be exported to, to mix with virgin pulp in our production facilities. Uh, far more efficient use of, uh, of uh, uh, resources and lowering our carbon footprint. The third major trust is really equitable part of it. You know, we call it inclusive progress, which basically focuses a lot on the community around us. You know, and when, when we talk about doing good for the community, uh, what do we mean by that, right? Is it good for us or good for them or good for country? So you, we use the UN SDG to really uh, establish the needs of the community, you know, and looking at Indonesia, where April is, for instance, uh, there are several key things, right? Uh, poverty is still an issue. So one of our key targets is really eliminating extreme poverty in the villages around us, so to speak. And we have identified 207 villages where we will go in and try and intervene, right? The second aspect of, of that uh, uh, target is stunting. In Indonesia, it is still a major problem, you know, and I think Desmond talks about it. In the first thousand days, if you don't feed the kid enough with nutritious food and give them stimulation uh, in terms of intellectual, uh, their full life will suffer, you know, uh, their food potential will never be realized. And worse still, uh, the nation will be encumbered with a lot of health costs as well. So that's an area which we are helping uh, the government uh, to try and reduce the stunting uh, rate in, uh, in, in the villages around us. The third aspect is, is uh, the area of education. In Indonesia, access to education is not an issue. But quality education, especially in the villages, rural villages around us, is an issue. And, and we are intervening in the schools in the villages to teach teachers, principals, and, and what have you, whoever is involved in the whole education sector, to try and uplift, even donating uh, uh, libraries and so on and so forth. At the end of it, uh, you know, we offer scholarships to people, to villages who can go but cannot afford uh, uh, the cost of a university. 
the last uh, KPI is really gender equality, right? I mean, uh, not only within the company itself, but also in the communities around, because we know that Indonesia, being a Muslim population, the ladies tends to be in the back seat, right? And, and so we started uh, the batik industry in, 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 uh, in, in our <coughs> complex. You know, essentially we brought experts from Jogja to come and train the local women folks. And they started painting bate and producing bate. And of course, the company then bought some of this bate for our uniform, which we wear now and then, so to speak. <coughs> so that is the, the, the issue of community, equitable part of it. Enabling, how do we enable it, right? I mean, these all targets and all that are not just set from the top. You know, it's actually involving everybody in the, in, the, in the company, you know. So on one hand, the senior management push ambitious target. From the bottom, they push for more realism, so to speak, right? Somebody said marriage is a, a transition, is a marriage of ambition versus reality, right? So, so, so all the targets and all that are agreed with by everyone in a complex, in a manufacturing, and embedded in the KPI, right? And, and uh, the performance bonus and all that depends on it. So that's how we enable it. And every year there's a reporting and we just produce our latest uh, report, sustainability report, uh, where all these uh, dimensions are reported on. You know, and we'll continue to monitor it. Of course, now it's already 2023 and we are looking uh, uh, at reviewing this by 2025 so that we have a equitable transition plan up to 2035. We are not going to shift the goalposts, of course, for 2030. You know, by the way, you know, we set 2030 as the, as, the, as the mark because we want the current lot of executives who, who will probably not be around by 2050, right? For them to be responsible and for them to take the necessary actions to meet the targets for 2030. So that is how we are enabling equitable transition. Thank you very much, Su Kiang, for that very uh, in-depth you know, um, explanation of how a corporate can respond to the equitable transition. Eric, I want to come back to you. So UOB brands itself as an ASEAN bank. And last year, you've also made this 2050 net zero commitment um, to support a just transition for ASEAN. How are you crafting this roadmap and how are you measuring progress? So, uh, thanks for the question. Um, this concept is just transition. I think we need to get quite clear what we think the definition for this part of the world is, right? And it's balancing decarbonization, you know, if you're focused on the environment, but, you know, we can expand the sustainability asset class in a bit. But with um, energy access, uh, affordability, uh, security, supporting economic growth and development. Now, at first glance, this conversation's been had a couple of times, at times, and people tend to draw back and go, no, no, that's an excuse for, I still want to grow, and so let me grow. But I think there's actually a much more nuanced uh, uh, concept of this, which is how do we ensure decarbonization on the country and region's terms that recognize where the country is, its social economic development needs, right? and being able to craft transition pathways, clean energy transitions, sectoral development plans that are able to allow them to retire old capital stock with uh, investing in new capital stock that's fit for purpose for a 2050 world. I, I, I think that's that larger conversation. So when we set our net zero targets across our six sectors, we touched two large ecosystems. One was energy, very important, and the other one was built environment. And as an example of how seriously we took this, when we looked at oil and gas, right, we looked at all of the pathways that uh, were available regionally, and finally, we backed off on a reduction target. The reason we backed off on the reduction target was when we looked at the various regional pathways. You had some that said 2023 to 2030, you increase oil and gas, and then from 2050 to 20, uh, 2030 to 2050, this drastic drop. You had other pathways that said, you know, you, you, you drop in a straight line. And when we looked at this variation of pathways, it became very clear to us 
nobody knew what they were talking about. None of these pathways were either executable, delivering economic growth with, in a balanced way, and none of these pathways had national level agreement, commitment, alignment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what's the point of setting a target that you know the system can't, can't deliver to? Right? That's an ex exercise almost in futility. So what we decided to do was we set a sectoral commitment on no new oil and gas, but we put all of our efforts on the clean energy transition now into three major areas. Number one, advocacy. Anyone who will listen to us, regulators, real economy players, you guys in this room, part of what we see our role is helping you guys understand, helping all of us collectively understand, we've got to have reasonable, balanced uh, pathways for the energy transition, for example, that we can all align, agree, and execute to. That's the first thing. The second thing is building the ecosystem solutions to support our nations and our clients within those sectors to do what we can do now, right? So things like solar, wind, geothermal, et cetera, et cetera, where the technology is already mature, where the commercials already make sense, nobody's sitting here making excuses on that we can't do it. We'll do it, right? But at the same time, let's not have that cute story that we tell ourselves to go, oh, yay, we're doing a great job, aren't we? We're doing a great job with what we can, but we're going to run out of bullet unless we solve that larger structural conversation. Right? So that's kind of how we think about an equitable transition as well. So we are coming up to almost a year when we set our net zero targets, and we're going to progress our one-year annual progress update to our net zero targets, I think, pre-COP, right? Now, I invite you to take a look at our progress update, because what you will see there is not, yay, UOB is doing great, and it's not a fairy tale version of how awesome the world is. It's going to be a report that is designed to provide an update on what we're doing, as well as insights on what we think isn't working. Because we need government, we need real economy, we need financiers. We talk about blended finance. Is blended finance at scale yet? Everybody knows the answer to that. No, right? So what we actually want the progress update to be is a hard, real conversation on what we need next in the next few years so that we can keep that momentum going. Thank Thanks, you so Jessica. much, Eric. And you know, I think uh, they've given a very good response to the critics who give banks a hard time, right? Because you have financed emissions and very often we always say, well, you know, the banks are putting money in, in um, projects that are not compatible with the outcome that we want. But the whole idea around the transition is that we can't change things overnight as much as we want to. And what kind of strategy fits which market is so critical. So now that we've had the ASEAN overview, can we come to Federico, to the Philippines? You know, as the largest bank in the Philippines, you have been leading the way with sustainable finance products and mechanisms. How is it fed? Well, we started, well, for our bank at least, we started, uh, sustainability made sense to us, even before this was a conversation. So we were doing this, and then we partnered first with uh, IFC, and we got the technical expertise in understanding how to assess loans, how to monitor loans, how to check for real impact. And then after that, then came the regulation. So when the regulations came, it, was, it first came from our SEC. So listed companies need to have sustainability reporting using the global standards in, in disclosure. So it first impacted the listed companies. Now, uh, but then this was led by the conglomerates. Our bank, we are ourselves is a banking conglomerate of 27 corporations, but we are owned by the largest conglomerate in the Philippines. So it was started by our mother company. Then we started seeing that our bank has actually been doing this. So we started making our report before the SEC required, uh, before the central bank required banks. So first it was listed companies, then banks. We are a banking conglomerate. We have three kinds of, ne three networks of banks, a universal bank, uh, MSME banks, that's a separate network, and private bank. Plus, we have uh, securities brokerage, we have insurance company. So the, the, the whole, the, the whole global, we saw that it, we can leverage what you were good at. We will not promise everything. We will try to look at where we're good at and leverage that to help. But so, and our board, uh, we came up with our, with our, with our game plan 
First, it was called a, um, a social and environmental policy. This got changed. Then the, the regulator came uh, with, the, with the BSP, our central bank, and it gave us a language. It gave us the parameters so that the conversation begins at board level. So it's, and we, be, we believe that it's where it should begin for corporation, at the board level ownership. But then when our board tried to look at this, we came up with our own, um, we looked at transition from a risk, with risk lenses, with risk disciplines, and with risk language. But then suddenly it transitioned to, there are actually opportunities here. It now transitioned to not just to rules and credit and how to assess, it transitioned to the investments that are actually opportunities. Sustainability is good business. It's, and and it, uh, we ended up there. And so based on that, we ended up financing 58 of the biggest projects in renewables in the Philippines, and we're actually financing two who are abroad. But then also, we saw, we came up with our energy transition statement, and it took our board 26 versions, because we wanted it to be real for us, so that when we release it out there, we know that we will stand by it, whether anybody is checking about it or not. But then that transition statement is actually a conversation, not between the bank and the regulators, it is a conversation between us and our clients. I know that the, the sexy part is to remove the portfolio that's, that's in the dirty portfolio, as we can call it, in our loan books. But no, we are telling, we better transition that. What good is it if they leave our books, if they go just to the books of another bank? That does not, that's not going to make sense. We might as well, we are talking to the client saying, we transition you, we will join you in understanding and in transitioning in, an, in this transition. But then we realize the transition will not happen in a vacuum. An industry has a footprint. It impacts communities. So we better be prepared to also, we are committed to, to, to provide capital for communities that will be affected. So how do we understand that community so that we can understand communities? Because the communities, we are, uh, just for context, we are a country with 7,640 islands. And the, the impact of climate is so different in our country. We talk about sustainable finance to prepare countries for a climate event. Climate event is happening in my country the whole year round. We have 20 of the typhoons. Five of them are in, see, in the US when there's one typhoon, everybody watches it. We have 20 of those in a year. Not only that, we have earthquakes and volcanoes. Before I left, there was, they thought we were LA. We had smog in the city. That came from a volcano about 100 kilometers from the city. We are not preparing for climate event. We are in a climate event. We are very practiced in this. So when we talk about, about uh, tax incentives, we don't have to wait for tax incentives. It is survival and resilience that is driving us. And so when we transition our clients, we're telling the clients we'll transition with you, but including the communities where you have a footprint. That's why we approach uh, really a, a not intuitive approach to banking, digital, digital and physical. We, are, we have brick and mortar in 94% of the communities in the Philippines, of the, the what you call the barangays, is the lowest, the smallest uh, local government unit. But then when we, we have that, we also know that these are not communities, it will impact individuals. So our commitment to transition is not just with people who are our clients. We tell our clients we'll transition you before, during, and after. We will transition the community where you will impact when you collapse your old technology. And those of the people who are downstream, we will help them. Because I believe when you say equitable transition, the emphasis is on equitable. And when you talk equitable, you are talking the S in ESG. <laughs> Freddie, I'm always so impressed by your enthusiasm and passion. And obviously, you, you know, the Philippines, they, they live and breathe this topic every day. And you're right, you know, with the climatic events. Um, and on that note, you know, I mean, you, let's, let's talk a little bit about the energy transition. And I encourage all of you to, you know, put in your questions into Slido as we go into the question and answer. Um, you know, the energy transition is a huge, huge topic in, in the region. And um, Mike, you know, you had mentioned to me when you started, you were financing core projects. Sorry to 
kind of out you uh, on the stage here. Um, but now you are financing coal phase out projects. And of course, you know, the banks are all putting a lot of um, financing into large scale renewable energy infrastructure. Um, what are your thoughts on, you know, how quickly we're doing it in terms of like, how do we accelerate that pace of adoption? Um, just on the note, um, I have actually in the past, yes, indeed, uh, financed <laughs> quite a few coal-fired power plants. But what I found quite interesting is this. Um, I ran into a, okay, I'll say regulator a couple of days ago, and I was talking to him. I've known him for a long time. And just maybe about four years ago, he came to me and he said, why are you still doing coal? And two days ago, he came to me and said, can you still do coal? Please help us <laughs> for the coal phase out. <laughs> and the other funny thing was that when I was doing the coal-fired power plant financing, there were a lot of social issues that we were talking about. And, um, you know, community needs to be displaced and there's going to be pollution, so on and so forth. And now we are looking at phasing out coal-fired power plants. Again, there are social issues, issues people are talking about. What happens to energy security? What happens to the communities that are going to be losing their jobs? How do we retrain them? So it's actually, you know, a coin has got two sides, right? And you see that there are a lot of social implications, whether we build a plant or we don't build a plant. And on your question, how to scale it up, you know, the projects that we are seeing, right? Whether coal phase out or other infrastructure projects or sustainable investments. To put it into context, if you look at um, ASEAN, we are 10 countries. Um, majority of us are actually developing countries. And if we were to implement projects in these countries, you have got a lot of um, emerging market risks. That would be political risks, nationalization risks, currency risk and contract repudiation risk. So all these risks need to be mitigated and somebody has to take that risk. As a bank, we are not in a very good, good position to take that. But what we have seen in the past is that a lot of deals are not really getting done, especially on the sustainability side. Not so much because there is a lack of capital but very much because there's a lack of bankability in these projects. And I'll tell you why, illustrate an example. So I have, you know, like you said, fired, uh, financed a few coal plants. If I were to do a coal plant in a developing country, I get a 600, 700 page power purchase agreement, watertight, and all the risks are properly allocated. I'll give you an example. So if the PPA, which is a power purchase agreement, signed between typically the off-taker and the investor, that is a very important document. And what we will typically see is that if there is a change in law in that particular country, which is, again, if I can remind you, is an emerging economy, right? So change in law is that risk is very real. And in a thermal coal PPA, if there's a change in law, the government or the off-taker will compensate the investor. And there are many provisions like that protecting the investor. However, if I switch to looking at a renewable energy project in the same country, I get a 15-page power purchase agreement instead of a 600-page, one five. And all the protections that I mentioned about are not in the renewable energy PPA. And as a result, the deals become unbankable. In fact, I've seen many deals in the past where just removing one paragraph in a power purchase agreement renders the entire project unbankable. So bankability is something very important. And I think the issue is that all the stakeholders have not come together yet and decide as, as a group as to how to make the projects bankable. In the particular case that I mentioned earlier, it was probably the host government where the project is being cited, right? The host government unilaterally coming up with a structure, thinking that everybody will find it bankable and do it. But the answer is no. And I've also seen other projects where the investor unilaterally comes up with a structure, thinking that the whole government will actually accept it. But again, no, it hasn't happened. What really needs to happen to scale up investments is for the community, everybody stakeholders, investors, um, banks, multilateral banks, as well as governments from both sides, the investing side, as well as the host governments, coming together and coming with a structure, where, whether you're talking about contracts, legal systems that actually protects, offers protection to investors, and the risks are properly allocated. 
we need to have a template to make it work because we cannot afford the time or the energy to negotiate contracts on a project by project basis. We actually need the template. Everybody agrees to it. That's the only time when we can actually scale up investments. Very well said, Mike. Thank you. Eric, I see you want to add something. Jump. Yeah, go ahead. I want to jump in on that because Mike and I will obviously talk about this quite a bit. There's one more element that I want to then uh, uh, add on to the answer is there is a question on who pays the cost of it. Because there's this conversation between global north, global south around you know the billions of dollars that will flow, but there are two nuances of that conversation. One is in the form of we'll lend you the money, mm -hmm. right? And you know it's the global north that says that. And then there's the give us the money which is how generally the global south positions it right so it's somewhere in that conversation that everybody's trying to step around and avoid and figure out how to structure around we need to come back to if you've got very young fleets right of cfpps across the region you're talking about five thousand. someone's got to get compensated for taking it up someone's got to take a loss who takes the loss? Who provides the money? Where does that commerciality right off bit really go? And we're still dancing around that question. If we can crack that, we can crack the alignment uh, issue. I think we can actually accelerate at pace. Mm, really good points and insights. Thank you. Federico, did you want to add some thoughts on that? So, <laughs> agreeing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the bankability issue Desmond had mentioned as well, right? And he talked about how philanthropic capital can come in to kind of assure the investors at the very high risk stage. Um, and I think that that's, uh, you know, a, a, a huge role that that plays. But you talked about this template. Who is the body that needs to come up with this template? I think the reality is that in the countries, in ASEAN, um, Many bankable deals has been done, have been done before, right? So there is already a template proven to be bankable. But every time when a new project is being rolled up, um, someone will try to roll back some of the concessions they have given in the past. And that typically takes a very long time. And in the context of ASEAN, I think what complicates the matter is that very often governments change. And whenever governments change, you see the board of directors of some of these SOEs change as well, and things get, just get stuck, right? So it's not so much needing to come up with new templates per se, because mm. the templates are already there, but just don't muck around with the templates that are already there and bankable. <laughs> Very good point. And I think this was also the elephant in the room at the ASEAN meetings recently, which is actually continuity. Uh, for the state-owned enterprises and not having to constantly reinvent the wheel or have different leadership, uh, you know, reset the process. I'm going to go to the questions. Uh, we have some interesting ones that have come in. And right at the top is the Science-Based Targets Initiative. Um, and this, as we all know, is an initiative that has been adopted by many companies in the world uh, who want to make credible interim targets on the way to 2050. Um, and the question here is that it's getting quite a lot of flack from Asian firms uh, because of the lack of renewable assets uh, and grid issues. And I think the, the issue here is that it, it stopped allowing companies to offset from different countries. So if you're in Singapore, for example, uh, and we are alternative energy disadvantage, how are you ever going to get to net zero? I mean, we have you know 80% of our grid that's coming from, 80 to 90% coming from natural gas. Any one of you want to take a stab? <laughs> so polite. <laughs> uh, okay, so I, I think SBTI, uh, there, there are two issues here that I think uh, we're talking about. Uh, one is it is quite intimidating to adopt an SD, SBTI certified or compliant plan. So if you look at the banks, for example, our net zero targets are not SBTI, financial services, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are net zero targets that we've built in alignment with, you know, uh, an aspiration of net zero by 2050, right? So one is just we have to recognize in uh, the developing part of the economy. I, I think one of the prior speakers spoke about the fact that we've got to build capability and capacity before we start, you know, holding people to to, to extremely high standards. The, the second point I kind of want to make around carbon offsets and carbon credits is. It is, at this point, and, and if I'm confused, I hope we're all confused, because I don't want to be the only person confused in this room, <laughs> is when we talk about corporates moving towards net zero by 2050 in an SBTI compliant manner, it's compensate, 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 and then whatever, I'm sorry, it's mitigate, 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 
And then whatever you can't mitigate, you can compensate through offsets. But the language is, by the time you get to 2050, after you've done all of your great mitigation work, then you offset. Now, the question is, can a firm take credit by using offsets today, right, and have that counted in multiple spheres of how they report to a bank? Can we take it as part of their finance emissions reduction, right, or uh, uh, finance emissions reduction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And I'm confused because I've heard answers that go, oh, no, no, no. And I've heard answers that go, yeah. <laughs> kind of, but very unclear as to when you can, cannot, or how. Now, the reason I bring this up is this is critically important. Who thinks the VCM carbon credits markets is in trouble? Surely not only me, right? <laughs> we know we have to fix it. And in order to fix it, we need three things. We need high quality supply. I need sustained demand. I need effective price discovery. Okay? Each of these component parts needs a different solve. Now, in the compliance markets, you get natural market demand because there's a cap. But in the VCM markets in which we operate, you need uh, a, a demand in a different way. And if we could say, if we could say to Asian uh, corporates or any corporates really, as part of your decarbonization carbon setting, uh, process, use SBTI concepts, make sure it's high quality, and also if you know that there's a bit that you can't uh, uh, mitigate at the end that you need to compensate for, instead of waiting till 2050, start compensating for it now because then you're using your balance sheet and your profitability today to contribute right, uh, uh, financing into carbon offset projects that desperately need that money and that demand and that nice ecosystem of demand, supply and price discovery starts to work. So that's actually my big question at SBTI. Mm. And I hope this gets to somewhere, someone in SBTI <laughs> and we won't collectively be confused about that anymore. Yeah, no, thank you, Eric, for those great insights and analyses. I think uh, there's a lot of confusion, that's for sure. And actually, this topic about carbon markets and credits was a topic of uh, much discussion at our pre-curtain uh, plenary yesterday as well. Um, and I think people are thinking that uh, under Article 6 of the UNFCCC agreements, um, actually, the governments have to come in and regulate the carbon credit sector. And our view is that it's going to become fully regulated. And so the VCM market can be complementary, but you can't do it without government intervention and regulation. So that's really interesting. I want to take another question uh, from the uh, Slido uh, in our audience today, and that's around uh, you know financial institutions uh, have committed to complete the phase out of coal financing, um, but uh, commitments for oil and gas are much fewer and less robust. Um, and I suppose that that is you know, a huge conversation that's happening now. Um, for every dollar that's invested into fossil fuel investments today is encouraging to see that $1.7 uh, is being invested into renewables. But if you think at, of the capacity, the global capacity um, of oil and gas, that's still massive. Uh, there's been a lot of negative uh, debate coming out of the New York Climate Week last week around COP28 um, and how much commitment we're going to see given that there's a very huge oil and gas lobby. So what are your thoughts on that? Mike, you want to go first? I'll take that. Um, key challenge, I, I think the first question I'll pose to everyone is how do you get to work or how do you get here today? Unless you actually cycled or you walked, then you probably took something that is based on fossil fuel. And if you cycle or you walk, you're probably quite wealthy because this is a CBD area. <laughs> and unlike many people who actually need to take public transportation, right? So I think there is still very much a need there. And coming back to OCBC, when we looked at the oil and gas sector, um, that was the, for in terms of setting our net zero targets, that was the sector we actually struggled the most. Because unlike other sectors where we were looking at what you call a emission intensity target, oil and gas, if you want to set a target, is um, it's just a straight line down. So when we set it, it was our 2030 target is 35% reduction in emissions, 95% by 2050. And it's a huge, absolute emissions reduction if you think about it. Is the world is going, is it, are we really going to wean ourselves off oil and gas? If you ask 100 people, you probably get, you know, 50% of the room saying yes, another 50% saying no, or maybe, you know, somewhere uh, a bit more uh, tilted than that. 
but it was a very major and difficult conversation for us, especially on the systemic side, trying to talk to my colleagues on the business, right? Because they are the ones who actually need to um, talk to their clients, engaging them about the need to reduce our dependence on oil and gas. And a lot of conversations, I think, point to the fact that it's probably not going to be very realistic. However, we took the decision to set those targets for two key reasons. I think, first of all, if you look at some of the NDCs as well as net zero targets that countries, governments, companies are increasingly making, we took a leap of faith that if those commitments actually do come into fruition, we will be able to achieve our net zero uh, targets. And the second really is that can we, whether you want to say as a human race or as a society, can we afford to wait anymore? And we only have a carbon budget for, depending on who you talk to, it could be eight years or 10 years, right? So I think it is quite imperative that we set the target ambitious, whether we can meet it or not. Um, we probably have to do it with a leap of faith, but it's important that we set our sights there and try to aim for it and go for it. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, I want to feel a question about climate adaptation to Federico. Um, a lot of banks, they're doing a lot on climate mitigation, but as you've just shared so passionately, you know, climate is here and now, you're living it. What are some of the measures that you've taken on the adaptation side? Well, on the adaptation side. Yeah. yeah. On the adaptation side, we definitely know that innovation and technology is there. But we have two disruptions. Technology itself is a disruption. But when climate event happens and there's no electricity, there's no telco coverage, your technology goes out the window. So it, your adaptation has to be on both ways. Okay? The, ability, the ability to be able to, to shift quickly between both manual and the, at least the core manual processes. And uh, like what we adapted in our back, we split our operations. We do BCP every day. Usually you have BCP when something happens, you switch to BCP mode. In the middle of the pandemic, what we did was we built every year 100 additional branches. So we are actually present because if technology is down, your presence in the community is reassuring. And the first volunteers are actually our people in our branches uh, where we are. But then also on the, on the split operation side of, of banking, every unit that we have is split into two, uh, into two areas, uh, even, uh, even in Manila. So that if one, one side uh, shuts down because of, uh, I, I, and we tested this during the pandemic, or because of an event, the, the other part can actually run, including what, what the other half was trying to do, and not change our ability to handle volumes at BAU. We don't shift to BCP, to BCP level in terms of capacity, but that's more expensive because we're in two units, and we have to be very careful in where to place the, the split operations. For example, they must, they must not be in the same tectonic plate, or they must not be in the same electronic grid. And uh, we were wise. We trans we, part of our operation is near the head office of the electric company, because that's the last place to lose power. So, but then, so, and then the ability, of course, to train our people, to be able to do hoteling very, very quickly. But then if somebody is affected in one place, the report that goes to the regulators in that place can be finished by the other side. Approval on this side can be approved on that other side. Mm. Because if Manila gets hit, and usually it's Luzon, which is the northernmost island gets hit, we cannot shut down the rest, the rest, of, uh, the rest of the archipelago. Mm. So that's one. Uh, and we have to train our people. When we train from our board level down to, we have 40,000, for context, we are 40,000 employees. 40,000 employees, we have to trickle down the understanding of sustainability down to our last employee so that sustainability and adaptation is understood at a function level. Mm -hmm. it, they understand how their function can impact that. So even if, and most banks pirate from our, uh, from our people, even when they go to another bank, they are already sustainability warriors by the time they leave. Right, done with their family. We have an employee volunteer program where they can actually volunteer in the place where they are. And even our board members, we join them to rehabilitate a school, paint a school, whatever it is. So sustainability is a language from our, from our chairman down to our last 
and our very new employee. And you have to do it that way because there was there's something that changed in the climate in the Philippines. It used to be the typhoons follow a path. We used to call it the typhoon belt. But now, it has become a Russian roulette. I mean, apologies to Russia. But <laughs> we don't know where it will hit. We don't know if it's an earthquake. We don't know if it's a volcano erupting or if it's a typhoon coming or where the drought will move. We don't know where it's going to hit. So we have to prepare everybody. Excellent. No apologies to Russia, I would say. Um, but thank you so much for those views. And, you know, on, on adaptation, it's so critical because we see in daily headlines now that uh, organisations or governments that don't think about climate resilience or social resilience get very often get caught off guard. And, and that is going to affect um, the assets that they own. That's going to affect their reputation. Uh, so that's really, really critical. So I know all of you are hungry. So I'm going to wrap up with my final question and invite Su Kiang to, to reflect on this. You you know, the theme, enabling an equitable transition. If there, you had a magic wand or maybe a genie um, and you had one wish, uh, you know, for this region, what would that wish be, Su Kiang? Well, uh, it's my personal view. It doesn't reflect what <laughs> my company says, you know. I, I th my wish is really looking into small modular reactor. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> okay. Because to me, uh, 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 and... and it's not the uranium base, but the thorium base, uh, which produces far less uh, uh, nuclear waste. Uh, and thorium is available in a lot of countries. And, and the reason I say that is from an energy transition, right? I mean, you talk about ammonia, you talk about hydrogen, you talk about solar. Solar depends on the sun. Wind depends on the wind. Uh, my question is, when the climate effect takes place, how will it affect the sun? How will it affect the wind, right? I mean, people talk about mangrove growing a, a, a blue carbon, but when sea level rises, the, the mangrove goes underwater, there's no more blue carbon, right? But if you look at nuclear, you, you generate it, you plug it in, everything goes to the grid, right? Ammonia, you need infrastructure, hydrogen, you need infrastructure. It takes a long time, you know? And, and I'm not saying that is the only solution. I'm saying that we need to we need to take a look at it now as a backup solution if all things fail. I mean, you go nuclear first, solve a lot of problems, reduce a lot of carbon, and later on, okay, when ammonia comes on board, you can, you can do that, right? So if I have my wish, I go and buy an aircraft carrier, nuclear powered, plug into the grid, and that's it, I have electricity and <laughs> clean you. electricity. But Thank you, Sukhyang. That's that my personal view. That wasn't quite the answer I was expecting. Um, but very interesting. And I mentioned, you know, the ICs event uh, that we were last, last week. And actually, nuclear has had a renaissance since um, the ongoing war in Ukraine. And that's because, you know, there's a lot of difficulty in terms of the stability of renewables, which we can't deny. Um, and I know that Singapore are actually setting up a center for nuclear safety for the first time in its history. Uh, are you on the board? Is that what you're saying? No. <laughs> oh, you're not. Okay. So, interesting. And, and, and interestingly, somebody asked during the panel, where are we going to put a, a nuclear reactor in Singapore? And someone said, Drong Island. So, <laughs> you know, maybe in the future. Uh, Mike, your reflections. What is that one thing you wish for? I, uh, I wish for more collaboration, more partnership among the different stakeholders. I was almost tempted to say world peace just now. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but, truth be told, I think we really need, you know, all hands on deck. And... If you look at climate change and all the sustainability issues, right, they are complex, huge, and wicked problems. And we need everybody to come together to solve it, right? And more specifically, if you look at the case of Singapore, we, everybody knows that we don't have a lot of renewable energy resources. Limited land for solar, limited wind, and 95% of our energy actually comes from gas at the moment. So the only way we can actually go greener and decarbonize is to import energy. But quite worryingly, over the past two to three years, what I have seen is that countries, not only in ASEAN, but also globally, right, that people are getting more nationalistic when it comes to their carbon credits, whether they are, we're talking about their RECs, renewable energy certificates, or even the renewable energy uh, resources. They don't really want to share. They don't want it to go cross-border. But the reality is that if Singapore does not reduce emissions, the emissions are not going to stay in Singapore. 
everybody is going to be affected, right? Whether it's within ASEAN or even outside of ASEAN, it's going to affect everybody. So I think we really need more collaboration, systems thinking, nobody working in silos. And as ASEAN, we always talk about hunting as a pack. But honestly, when it comes to climate change, biodiversity loss, sustainability issues, I think it's equally important, if not, imp not more important, that we actually defend as a pack. Mm. Very well said. Thank you, Mike. And Freddie. Well, you said the emphasis is personal, right? Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I was trained and I began <laughs> as a solicitor with the Office of the Solicitor General. I used to argue uh, murder and rape cases in the Supreme Court. <laughs> oh, I took up law because I, was not, I don't like math, and now I ended up in the bank. Yeah, I met my destiny on a road I took to avoid it. But then I wish, my wish is that um, the banks and the companies in my country will have the same journey as our board had in BDO. Because in our journey, we know that sustainability of the bat, it has to be owned by the board. And the board in the journey will discover two things. The first discovery is this is way beyond business. And this, is, this becomes personal. Our board members have a missionary uh, zeal about them. I'm just a, a downstream reflection of them. They have a missionary zeal about this because it becomes personal. But then, even so, you actually need the regulators at the start, but towards the end, when you begin to understand that sustainability is sound and good business, you have to say, step aside, we are doing this. It's personal, it's good business. That's sustainability. I wish that the boards, other boards, would understand that. And that's, I believe, our, in our the challenge for us, 80% there. The moment you get, the moment you get that, they get educated on that, the next, then you have to start embedding it in everything that to do. This is not a compliance issue. This is not a project that you do. This is something that you become. It impacts all the decisions, how you choose clients, suppliers, how you train your people. Everything is affected by it from education and then from um, uh, embedding it in everything that you do then you empower it. You cannot do this without technology, but responsible technology. Technology driven by human needs. So technology that aids the human decision-making. Mm. Very, very well said. And on the role of the boards, I must point out that we're going to have a fireside chat on that as well. And it's so important because they are the stewards of good governance in any organization. Last words, Eric. Yeah, thanks. Um, I wish for an activated citizenry. Right? And the reason I, I wish for an activated citizenry that will demand sustainable outcomes, sustainable plans, sustainable products, is that is that one point that will hold politicians and governments accountable. You get voted in if you make the right sustainable decisions. You get voted out if you do not. That activated citizenry also holds corporates responsible. I will buy your products if you build them right and sustainable. I will not buy your products if you do not. And also holds each other accountable in terms of how communities work, societies live uh, around each other. It's, it's a big dream, but I think as we move along, we are already starting to see generational shifts. Right? Let's be honest, there is an age difference I'm sorry, there's an age category in how people think about sustainability. We are sustainability converts. There is a class of the citizenry that are sustainability natives. They don't think of sustainability the way we think of, which is trade-offs. They think of it as in, why would you do anything any other way, right? Mm. So that's what I hope for. No, that's very well said, Eric. And, you know, I was going to say that uh, in, in this, this last weekend, there was the SG Climate Rally, um, and we had a lot of youths, you know, advocating for, for climate action. And there was one individual who walked around with the I Love Fossil Fuels t-shirt. And it was really interesting because when the team spoke to him, he said, I'm here to represent the mainstream um, voice because the climate conversation is perceived sometimes to be very elite. And we must never fail to recognize that we need to communicate why this is a problem for everyone, but that it's also a solution that we can all be part of. So please join me to thank the speakers. I know all of you are hungry, um, but hopefully we've given you some food for thought.